so today I will talk about uh, really the fundamentals of a case library as well as the DICOM curricular, the curriculum of the Anatomash table, which is um, highly integrated or, or has the case library being highly integrate, integrated in the DICOM curriculum. First of all, um, just start a little bit about the Milwaukee School of Engineering. So as uh, Jake pointed out, I'm on faculty at the MSOE uh, and I'm closely affiliated with our biomedical engineering program, um, part of the electrical engineering and computer science department. So Milwaukee School of Engineering is an independent nonprofit university uh, located in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was founded in 1903. Uh, we have approximately 2,800 students enrolled, and we offer a number of uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in a variety of engineering disciplines, and biomedical engineering is, is one of the programs. In addition to that, we have a School of Nursing, a School of Business, a uh, Computer Science uh, program with emphasis on um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Uh, and we offer majors in actuarial science and user experience. So the, the main sort of uh, purpose, I guess, or, or what the MSOE does very well is really bringing real world experience in to the classroom across all of our disciplines. And I think that's where the Anatomash table really comes in um, and fits very well into, into our university mission across our uh, programs. So a little bit about Anatomash. So we've uh, we've received this table or purchased this table as part of a uh, gift from uh, one of MSOE uh, regions. And the table was installed, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in the summer of 2019. I think Jake and uh, Jackie from Anatomash may, may correct me on that one, but I think it's um, 2019. Uh, and since then we have been integrating uh, the table across uh, different programs and within different courses more and more every year. So partic in particular, what you see here uh, are kind of the four major disciplines where we use the table quite a bit. So biomedical engineering, and that's really where I fit in, and I will give you uh, our perspective from the biomedical engineering program. Um, the nursing, of course, School of Nursing, and this is where I think the, the use of the Anatomash table is really more in a traditional, um, it, it uses some of the traditional approaches, I would say. Uh, the table is used to some extent in our Masters of Science in Cardiovascular Perfusion, and we also found that the table is incredibly useful in our K-12 STEM outreach programs that we do throughout the academic year as well as in the summer. So as I said, I will focus on how we use the table in the biomedical engineering program. Firstly, because this is really where I sort of live and, and spend my days uh, and where I use the table. And also because I think it is, uh, it maybe um, kind of shows a, a non-traditional or not entirely traditional approach to using the Anatomash table in the classroom. So here I have four um, courses where we have integrated the table. So the first one is the Introduction to Biomedical Engineering course, which is a first year freshman uh, course where students are introduced to biomedical engineering field. It's a very interactive course. It covers all branches of um, biomedical engineering and also introduces students to anatomy and physiology, introduces students to medical imaging as well. Well. So we've used the table in that class uh, quite a bit from, from the very beginning when we acquired the table. Uh, biomechanics is um, another course where we've used the table to some extent. Uh, but since the main 
sort of topic of my presentation is the case library and, and the DICOM curriculum. I'm going to really emphasize this set of courses. So medical imaging systems, with, which I teach, um, and it, it's in fact going to be offered in the winter again, uh, is a senior level course. And I feel that the table fits into the curriculum of that course very, very well. And the second one here, of course, is anatomy and physiology. But what I'm going to talk about a little bit here is not the traditional anatomy and physiology course that you would have um, in, in, a, in a science program or a nursing program, which in our school of nursing, of course, the table is used in the anatomy and physiology courses as well. But here I'm going to talk a little bit about our new course that we are um, actually in the process of developing for uh, one of our undergraduate certificate programs that would focus on medical imaging applications. So this particular course is geared towards radiological applications. So it's anatomy and physiology for radiological applications. And so um, it's really centered around um, anatomy and physiology concepts presented in the context of medical images. So what would anatomical structures look like in medical images? What would the function look like, let's say, in four-dimensional um, images uh, taken as a function of time so, so that you can visualize function as well? So as you can imagine, the case library comes in very, very handy. If, you, if, you're not, if you've used the table before and if you've interacted with the case library, you would see that it fits very well um, in this context. So in particular, with respect to the medical imaging course, and I will really probably uh, focus on that a little bit more. Um, really, once we've acquired the table, I was able to do something that I've been thinking about since you know, my first days at MSOE 15 years ago, when I started teaching medical imaging systems, when I came from the industry uh, where I worked in the medical imaging field, and that is to make it really uh, centered around clinical radiological applications. Um, traditionally, medical imaging systems course is really uh, taught from the perspective of technology. So we talk about the physics of medical imaging, we talk about uh, software development, right, image processing algorithms for specific applications and so on. Uh, and certainly the clinical applications are discussed, but Traditionally, it is not the focus of the course. Well, I always felt that um, this was a little backwards and, and we do need to um, really focus on how all these techniques and systems are used in, in the world of radiology. So with the introduction of table, we can do quite a bit um, in that regard. And the reason it, this was challenging to do in the past, or it is challenging still to do, I would say, is because it is challenging to get access to a sufficiently large number of clinical DICOM uh, imaging data sets, those that come with uh, medical histories annotated by radiologists that have some ground truth defined in those images that have, you know, artifacts and pathologies and just interesting findings overall and variability from, uh, from one image set to the next and so on. Um, and, you know, so that that's one reason. Uh, the second reason is really having access to image processing tools that are at the same time easy to use and quick to learn so that the students can start, you know, applying uh, and using these tools fairly quickly images, but such that the tools are also sophisticated enough to be able to resemble what you see in the commercial medical imaging uh, processing system, something that you would, would be used in the hospital radiology department. There are certainly plenty of tools we can use in the medical imaging setting, but they're not necessarily very straightforward. And so it, it, it's tough when you try to do so much in a given course uh, to find the tool that has the simplicity as well as the sophistication that would fit this particular course. And that's where Anatomash 
cash comes in. Uh, we, we kind of found a, a, a really, really nice combination of all those factors within the Anatomash table. As far as this anatomy and physiology course, I mentioned that the, the one we are currently developing and should be offered uh, in the next academic year, uh, it's focused on uh, anatomy and physiology for radiological applications. So while we do, you know, present the cadaver images uh, and animations um, in that course, and, and we use the standard simulations and models, we also um, like to present the anatomy and physiology in the context of medical images. So before I show you some examples of what we've done and how we use the table, I will do a, a brief overview of what the case library is about as well as the DICOM curriculum. So technically speaking, case library and DICOM curriculum are two independent uh, tools within um, Anatomash table. However, they're highly integrated with one another. In fact, the DICOM curriculum uses the cases that come with the case library. And so I'm going to talk about both of them um, because they're highly related and, and really can be used to complement each other in the classroom. So first of all, the case library. And many of you uh, may be familiar with that, so I will I will try to not to dwell on some of these things. And, and if you do have questions, I'll be more than happy to respond and answer um, after after the presentation. So Clinic, the case library basically as the name implies um, gives Anatomash users access to hundreds of computer tomography, so CT and magnetic resonance imaging or MRI clinic image sets. They come in a standard DICOM um, image format. Not only we have these cases, these are real patient cases, uh, they come, many of them, come with detailed uh, clinical histories as put together by radiologists, uh, potentially uh, emergency department physicians and so on. Some are much more detailed than others. So there's a there's a lot of information. Uh, there's a number of cases in the case library that also comes with very specific annotations. So when you load these cases, you can actually see pathology outlined arrows pointing to specific pathology that, that, with additional comments and clarifications provided by the anatomage engineers when they were putting together the, the case library. Um, all of these cases are very interesting. So the pathologies that you would see are very interesting pathologies. Um, in addition to that, there are segmentations. So from many of these cases, uh, very specific anatomical structures or systems have been segmented, and you can look at those outside of um, the overall system. For visualization, so those are time-dependent imaging data sets, um, potentially showing blood flow um, or uh, motion of the heart, whatever it may be. A new feature that I find particularly um, helpful in my classes is the case comparisons feature, and I'll talk about that. But it essentially allows one to compare cases within the case library. And some of these case comparisons are already pre-made for you. Um, so you can select some of those or you can um, import some of your own. These case libraries are further integrated in another tool within the Anatomash table known as the DICOM curriculum. So this is there you get information that's very similar to the cadaver information where you know structures are annotated and shown and highlighted and so on. Except here, uh, these structures are annotated and highlighted within a clinical image data set. Um, and I will show you a little bit about that. So this is essentially the anatomy presentation, but in medical images. And finally, again, I find that feature very, very useful in my classes. Um, Anatomash allows you to import 
open and display uh, your own image data set. So we have um, access to DICOM image data sets that come from, from various hospitals. And we have a library of these cases ourselves. And I like to use those in my classes. So it, we can visualize our own cases. Um, it, you know, the functionality is very well integrated within the table so that they pop up just like the built-in uh, clinical cases. Uh, this time, um, this feature is optimized for CT and MRI, but I did hear at the UGM, you guys are working on, I, I thought it was ultrasound, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm hoping to see that um, in upcoming releases. And so here on, on the right side of the screen, I do have a couple of images that come with the case library. So this, this one in the background is basically showing you uh, the main uh, menu, as well as some selections. And I'm gonna talk about those a little bit. So case library, uh, first thing that I'm gonna talk about is really that here's the main menu, right? All these cases, there are hundreds of them. They're very well organized um, within the case library. You get their search features and things like that. Um, right here on the left in yellow, I'm highlighting the main, uh, the main menu that basically um, um, categorizes these cases based on the region. So you have the head and neck region, you know, you can have thorax and, and so on. You can have full body uh, and so on. The next step um, tab is the specialty region. So you can now choose uh, whether you'd like to look at neurology type uh, scans or, or cardiovascular or pulmonary, whatever it may be, or GI. Um, geriatric or um, um, potentially, you know, a, a, um, pediatric models and so on. Uh, segmentation. So this I talked about before. Some of these image sets have been used for segmentation. So in, in, in some of them, a brain has been segmented from the image set and you can uh, visualize and interact with, with a brain system. Uh, same can be for the pulmonary system or, or the cardiovascular or the heart itself, whatever it may be. A uh, really interesting one, it's, it's really uh, labeled as other in um, in an automage, but I, I think it's it's quite fascinating. So first of all, this lower left icon um, has the cine or uh, 4D visualization cases. So if if, if there was a 4D, um, so basically a movie uh, made. It's the motion of the heart or blood flow through the brain. Uh, there are various options there. You can visualize those cine cases. A really interesting animal models in here as well. Uh, some archaeology too. There, there's a CT scan of the mummy, for instance. Uh, and this one, I, I mentioned it before, and I'm going to talk about it. The one in the lower right is the case comparison um, tool that I find very useful for class demonstrations. And just to show you an example of what one of those case libraries could look like. And of course, this is not a full data set. This is, these are just some selected images. But uh, when you select a case, let's say you were interested, um, you know, in, in, um, in one of the um, abdominal aortic aneurysm cases, which is what I have pulled up in here. When you select that case, it gets loaded um, by default in, into, uh, well, the, the main view that you get initially would be the volume rendered or the three-dimensional view, which is the one I have here on the left. But you can also enable uh, the presentation of the original CT, in this case, images, so as they were taken. Um, and you can certainly change your orientations from axial to sagittal to coronal to oblique views, and you can visualize the anatomy um, more in a more traditional sense uh, as, as radiologists typically would. As I said earlier, many of these cases come with um, detailed clinical history. So here I just have a little blurb from uh, otherwise a much longer clinical history, which would 
essentially include notes on the patient made during this evaluation. Um, it, 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 so most of the cases would come with this clinical history, not all, but, but quite a few. DICOM curriculum, like I said, the case library is very well integrated within the DICOM curriculum. So in the, in the main menu, uh, when you just start up the table and the main uh, menu toolbar comes up, you can select a tab uh, or a button called curriculum. And if you activate it, you're gonna get these two options. One of them is the DICOM anatomy. So the segmented anatomy deals with the segmented uh, subsystems from the cadavers. Whereas the DICOM anatomy um, is specific to those um, case study cases. So once you select that, um, you get the option to choose the region of interest. So here in this demonstration, I selected a head and neck. And once you select the head and neck, you have an option of different subsystems within the head and neck. So you can choose the skeletal system, you can choose the muscular system, arterial supply, venous drainage, and so on. Um, and if you select one of those, you will be taken to a specific case that was used to uh, build the anatomy uh, and create various types of visualizations um, as well. So here I have the skeletal system selected and you can see it's just one of the image, one of the images that you can get or one of the types of visualizations that you can get. Um, and you certainly can see uh, all the labeling um, as well. So just, just to give you an idea of how this works. It's actually a really neat uh, tool. It allows you to play a video uh, where different presentations of the case are um, given one after the other, showing you the labeling, um, as well as different um, visualization um, filters as well. So to emphasize, for example, lungs versus the heart versus the skeletal system and so on. I'm going to show you another example here. So here, uh, again, I'm in the DICOM curriculum, and here I'm selecting a thorax. And uh, once I select thorax, among the options, I chose pulmonary cavities, pleura, and lungs. And so this particular case, this upper panel, is what's used to create uh, this labeled representation. So we have, in this case, a male, 21-year-old. It comes with a history. So you know, um, uh, you know the patients, so to speak, from a clinical perspective, that was used to create um, these labeled set of anatomies. So it's a 21 male uh, post multiple stab wounds to the chest. And this patient has a pretty extensive clinical history. I'm only showing a little blurb here. Um, and then you can, so I always start out before even looking at all the labeled options within the curriculum associated with a particular case, I like to look at the case itself. So before I even look at everything that's labeled, I look at the original um, image set. And so that, that's what I'm displaying here. So here in the middle um, with skin present, you know, I've identified one um, example, stab wound for this patient. Um, this next image is the volume rendered presentation uh, with the skin and muscle removed, right? It was uh, with a special filter selected in this case to accentuate uh, bone versus soft tissue. Uh, and here you can see too, this red plane indicates that the image to the right of it is gonna be the axial or cross-sectional representation at this level um, shown, it, shown in this image, um, in a volume rendered image. If you take a look at the axial, right, the black and white CT 
image on the far right, uh, you can even highlight it in yellow or outlined in yellow. You can uh, correlate that to the stab wound that's shown in, in, in the first image in, in the top panel. Uh, so after looking at you know the scan itself, reading the clinical history, now I know uh, what I'm dealing with, what I should be paying attention to as we're looking at at the anatomy. So then you have a choice, right? There's different labelings in various renderings that are done um, for pulmonary cavities, pleura, and lungs. And I only selected five options here. All of those are done as a video. So you, they, they spin around, you can spin them around, you can play different annotations um, the way you like it. You, uh, in this particular case, in addition to a CT image, this, this case also had um, AP view x-ray as well as a lateral x-ray of the patient. And so you can look, this um, lower left figure shows the AP view x-ray and you, you see, you know, the anatomical labelings. Uh, so si similarly, you got the, here um, the, uh, another black and white image is the lateral x-ray as well, uh, labeled appropriately. So very useful. We used, uh, we used the DICOM curriculum in, in um, uh, development of this anatomy and physiology course for radiological applications. Right. This is interesting because it, it already has this fully labeled curriculum, um, but it also has the pathology to go with it. So you, you could certainly look at some of these labeled structures and correlate that to, to an injury that the patient sustained or something along those lines or a potential intervention that was done. Uh, again, this is really more for the new users on the call. Um, I think in addition to the tools that you get uh, from the Anatomash table, you get a phenomenal set of documentation. Um, in fact, you know, for, again, for new users, I recommend that once the table uh, try to go through the folder containing all the documentation because chances are the information you're looking for to start using the table is, is there. In fact, I still use uh, these documents and I've been using the table quite a bit for the last few years. But the uh, application manual, right? Some of these things may seem um, self-explanatory, but I, I'm actually going to underscore the usefulness of these documents uh, they're, they're very usable, right? There, there's not excessive reading. It, it really takes you straight to the point of what you want to do. There's the case library tutorial, which honestly is how I started on using case library. The volume rendering guide, it talks about all these different filters you can use to um, enhance the presentation of the images and in which case to, do, to use which one, some of the recommendations. Uh, the case library itself, as I said, there are hundreds of cases in here. Uh, I want to say it's over a thousand, if I'm not mistaken, probably more. So it helps to know what's in the library. So there is a document, it's called case library descriptions, where every single case is described with its clinical history as well. So if you're looking for a specific case, it really helps to just open that document. It's very long, but uh, you can go through it and identify cases that would be useful uh, for your application. There is a supporting document known as the case library list. Um, that one just basically lists all the courses, uh, sorry, lists all the cases with their corresponding case numbers. There's a DICOM curriculum document. So basically that document gives you all this information for all um, anatomical systems of interest. So what's been annotated um, and how those anatomies were uh, presented. So you, this is where I go um, initially to see what I want to, what I really want to present. 
There are curriculum images that you, that essentially Anatomage provides a whole lot of images as well as videos of segmented anatomies from uh, these images as well as just images themselves. And certainly you've probably seen it, uh, sample table activities. And it, honestly, this is how we started on the table. We took a couple activities and implemented those, modified them. And um, after that, we just started developing our own. So a <clears throat> little bit on particular uses. At this point, I'm just going to go into some examples um, of how I use the table in my classes and how we also used it in the K through 12 um, engagement activities, STEM activities. So first of all, we design our own um, labs and in-class activities for the students using the table. Uh, we also use some of the built-in activities that come with the table, but we've modified those over the years. Uh, we do, I do in class demonstrations, especially in the medical imaging class, and we're likely going to be doing that in, in the new AMP for radiological applications class. Uh, we use it extensively for curriculum development. And so this really goes across all those four courses that I mentioned, uh, intro to biomedical engineering, biomechanics, especially with all these new kinesiology tools um, in the table. Medical imaging is probably the one that I use it most heavily, and uh, we use it quite a bit in the K through 12 STEM outreach. And the table um, has been made a major attraction for um, for students who come in, high school students or middle school students who come in uh, in the summer or during the academic year to do to participate in various uh, various. STEM outreach events. So I'm going to give you some examples, really one example or a couple of examples per type of activity or, or type of use that we've done over time. So this is from my uh, medical imaging systems class. Um, like I said, I, I try to make it, you know, centered around clinical radiological applications. So what do we use imaging for? What do medical images look like? Uh, what do cardiovascular um, cardiac imaging um, image sets look like? What do neuro sets look like? Uh, what would stroke look like? But not only that, right? With imaging, it, it, it's cha it's challenging. Not only we're looking at anatomy uh, and physiology in some uh, imaging sets, but we're also looking at a lot of artifacts, right? And we need to be able to differentiate artifacts from um, anatomy, right? From anatomical and physiological structures and and, and functional representations. Um, and oftentimes it's difficult. So I, I spend quite a bit of time in the class talking about uh, image artifacts and different imaging modality, whether it's CT, X-ray or MRI or ultrasound or PET, um, would produce these artifacts. Some of them are common across modalities, some are different. So here I'm, uh, I do always do a class demonstration um, so here's an example of um, artifacts in CT images. So when I cover this unit or module on artifacts in computer tomography, I show a lot of examples. And, the, you know, I went through the case library. I done uh, quite a few cases that show that those, some of them are clear cut. Some of them are actually confusing where you could miss, miss, or misdiagnosis, so to speak, for pathology versus an artifact. So on the far left, right, we have something called streak artifacts in here. Those are fairly simple to recognize because they're so systematic, right? They're, they're artificially, um, they're artificial, so to speak, relative to anatomy, right? This, this happens when you have dense structures in the image like teeth at this, in this image you have the, the it's an axial image of the brain or of the head, rather at the level of the teeth. And so the motion, motion of the jaw tends to really make those artifacts worse. And you can see the streak artifacts. It's pretty standard. Um, I do have a set of imaging here in the central panel. Uh, those are uh, beam hardening artifacts. 
And beam hardening artifacts really have to do with uh, differential X-ray attenuation by different structures. So dense structures tend to absorb a lot of the X-ray energy, whereas the softer tissue uh, tend to pass a lot more of it through. But what happens um, too is that if, when you have those dense structures, whatever comes out um, as the X-ray goes through, whatever comes out on the other end um, is going to produce these black streaks that you see. So in this case, you um, uh, an abdominal stent, aortic abdominal stent, um, or graft, um, and you can you can actually take a look here. With, you can clearly identify it in the image, and the streaks that you see, and I have an arrow point into that. Those are the very common beam hardening artifacts. That's from um, that's really from the graft itself. Uh, again, this is fairly straightforward, so th this is fairly easily recognizable. But when this becomes a challenge, and I really like to, you know, I have a set of uh, images to show that from the case library as an example here. So you, here you have a patient with a quite a large cavernous um, aneurysm in here. Um, you can certainly see it over here. And if you look at the axial image shown right below it, uh, and you see a red line indicates the level at which that axial image was taken, um, the arrow, the yellow arrow points to uh, this area right above it that is slightly darker than the gray of the of the brain tissue. If you um, are looking at this image, right, this really happens around the bone, dense tissue. This also is the area where, where strokes are fairly common or may occur, and especially with an aneurysm, if there's bleeding, uh, it, it's, it's likely that there could be uh, some, you know, ischemia in the brain. And if you look at this location, uh, if you are not familiar with the beam hardening artifacts, this area could be misrepresented or misdiagnosed for potential um, infarct or ischemic region um, in the brain. Whereas in reality, it's a pretty standard location of this beam hardening artifact because you're in the vicinity of, of the bone. So that in here too, I have an example in the cardiac image. I have an example of a motion artifact. Again, you can see the um, yellow arrow pointing to it in, in the far right image. So that, that just an example, and we spend time looking at all these various cases and the students get to participate if, you know, in a class discussion when I ask them, what do you think? Is this a pathology or is this, uh, or is this an artifact? Can you see an artifact in this image? And so, so it generates a pretty interesting um, conversation and it really trains their eye to these images and what they're looking for. Really briefly, I said I really like this feature. I know uh, probably over time um, is the case comparison feature. It's under the case library, under the tab other, uh, and it's highlighted in yellow in this um, uh, left top uh, image example. It allows you to compare uh, up to three cases at the same time. Um, and so the menu that you get after you click on the um, case comparison is in the lower left corner. Um, a lot of those comparisons have been made for you by Anatomash. So they've identified cases that likely have similar pathology, uh, but potentially with different presentations. So you can load those already built in uh, comparison cases, or you can select cases of your own choosing. And that is actually what I have shown right here. So I selected an internal carotid artery aneurysm in the largest panel on the left, and that we're looking at the central image. 
uh, the upper right corner is showing possible carotid aneurysm and uh, uh, lower right corner uh, shows bilateral carotid aneurysm. Um, I wish the anatomash, I'm actually putting my uh, wish list out there. Um, I wish the anatomash would also enable using your own uh, DICOM cases in here so that I can compare cases that um, I have in my own personal library, but currently it, it's really limited to the cases that are part of the case library, which is a ton of cases that you can look at. So these are particularly useful too, I think, for uh, in-class demonstrations. Now, this is a lab activity or a lab project that I uh, have my medical imaging students do. So this is a senior level class. Um, and uh, these students are really close to graduation. So they, they come in, they're very proficient at using programming tools, just tools in general. Um, they're familiar with software. Uh, they can do their own coding and so on. And they're learning a lot about image processing. But as I said earlier, the case library, an Atomash table in general, allows us to use very, very sophisticated set of image processing tools uh, quickly. You, you learn how to use them very quickly but they're really fairly sophisticated um, on the back end. Uh, it's not something that my students can sit and program, you know, in, in two hours, uh, but they can certainly use it in under two hours um, if it's simple enough to learn. So this is an example of um, a lab project where students get to use some of the very sophisticated uh, standard image processing tools and they can really look at uh, what it means um, and really in the context of real data. So here I have, um, I give the students, I had a neck uh, CTA scan, and this is one of my favorites really. Um, it contains a really large internal carotid artery aneurysm. And I like it because it's so obvious, even if you're not used to reading images, right? And for most students, it's really their first exposure. You can still identify it. Um, and they start out really using some fairly simple measuring tools, right? That, you know, you measure the diameter, you measure, um, you know, the, the two diameters, right? The, the, uh, of the aneurysm, you can uh, record that, compare it to clinical history. And then what I personally find very um useful in this lab is the two additional things. So one of them is they're able to use, I call it a vessel straightening tool. It's it really not necessarily that. It's, uh, if you can see my mouse, it's the icon in the middle. Um, it, it essentially, and if you look at the image, uh, so that the two panels on the right, the two top panels, this tool allows you to select a structure that you want to straighten, uh, among other things. And so you get to use some sort of spline interpolation tool uh, where you would select points. Those points get connected, and what you see in the bottom bottom right panel is the straightened version of that vessel, right? And I select one with the aneurysm and you can see the middle panel actually allows you to manipulate that tool even further so that you can widen it, you can rotate it until in this example, I'm actually including the cross-sectional area of the aneurysm. And now you can take measurements in the straightened and flattened view. Uh, the reason I selected this is because it's a really standard, it's a standard tool that's used in radiology. Uh, clinical systems have that tool and it allows, you know, uh, measurements of the, the vessel lumen, uh, especially when you're looking at stenosis and things like that. Maybe not necessarily with the aneurysms, but certainly uh, when you're looking at stenosis um, and it becomes um, really useful in that, in that context. So it's a real tool, it's used by radiologists. It's something that, um, you, know, you, you need to understand. Uh, then I also asked the students to use the cranial segmentation tool, and that's the little dissection tool with a red circle. You see that's the third bottom icon. So this one is specific to um, sets that are head and neck uh, sets so that there is cranium to segment. 
Um, and it's really perfected for uh, for those cases. And if you know if you're if you know medical imaging or at least a little bit, um, you know that it's a very challenging uh, problem in 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 uh, computer science to really be able to segment cranium from um, CT images and differentiate that vessels that have been enhanced by a contrast agent simply because the intensities are so close between the cranium and the blood vessel. Oftentimes that segmentation is not very successful. You do end up uh, subtracting or removing the vessel along with the bone. So Anatomage has a very sophisticated tool, a uh, very impressive cranium segmentation tool that can be used very easily just like any other dissection tool in, um, in the table. So here, Stu, we talk a lot about bone segmentation in our class. And so here the students get to practice it and they get to really see how it works and see what happens to the blood vessels. Are they in there? Are they intact? Uh, and it really becomes a problem when you're trying to remove the bone at the base of the skull. Um, so that I have the students do that and then take measurements of the aneurysm and, and surrounding vessels, you know, before and after segmentation and then see if they can get a more accurate measurement and see how those measurements are compared to, um, to what's recorded in the clinical history. Um, so this is an example of an online discussion. This is something that we're we're planning to integrate in our ANP for radiological applications class. It's a very simple module that looks at anatomical planes and positioning views. Um, and we want the students not only to be able to recognize that in schematics and, and models, but also to be able to recognize easily uh, in images and different image orientations. So here I selected a case uh, of the uh, it's a two gunshot track CT. Um, and uh, we're giving the students a set of images from that case, which are you know, selected very specific ones. Uh, some, there's the one axial CT, one sagittal CT, and four volume rendered uh, representations with different filters and different orientations. Uh, bullet is shown in yellow, and the students are asked to identify the bullet location with respect to the posterior, anterior, superior, inferior, left, right positions. Um, they also can reference specific anatomical structures, right? So in this case, if you read the clinical um, history, you'll see that it's uh, behind a six um, rib and so on. So you can identify those kinds of things. And students would participate in this online discussion and really document their thought process and how they came to the conclusion, what they considered, and so on. Uh, really briefly, this is um, um, uh, probably the most out of the box use that we've had with the Anatomash table over the years. And it's a final project where my medical imaging students are asked to design an object that we normally use to test medical imaging systems, uh, specifically for spatial resolution or how small can we resolve in uh, a structure to be in the image. The students get to 3D print their object. They get to image it uh, in the hospital uh, using CT and MRI. Uh, and they also get to image it using an ultrasound system that we have in one of our labs. Uh, and then they get to use the Anatomash table, at least for CT and MRI images, to visualize their objects. And you can see, so some of these objects are shown here. Students get very creative. Um, they, you know, they put a Darth Vader, and sometimes they have Eiffel Towers and things like that, and they make them of various sizes and diameters and, and different volumes and so on. So you can even see it's a set on the far right uh, in the top panel, you have a set of ultrasound images where you can even recognize a uh, Darth Vader, which is really quite impressive. Not easy to uh, scan these types of things using ultrasound. Uh, but with the CT and MRI images, they then import these images. Uh, they come in a DICOM format. They import them into the Anatomash table, and they perform a set of measurements with that. They also compare those measurements to another uh, programming tool that we use uh, called MATLAB, which many of you may be familiar with. In that tool, the students have to do their own programming. So they get 
yet to do manual programming to estimate or or measure the same uh, objects in their in their or small objects within their larger object. Um, and compare that to the Anatomash table measurements. So they then get to present their work in a poster form, and we even give them prizes for uh, a best design in the best design competition. The last thing that I just want to show you is our K through 12 STEM activities. The most success we've had, I think, uh, is with the uh, a preset table activities, the ones that come with all the supporting documentation, we've modified them. We have to simplify them, of course. I think they're uh, designed for, you know, college level a and P courses. So we've simplified them. Students really enjoy the meet the cadavers part. So we took in this example, a female, uh, Asian female cadaver. Um, and some of the structures the students get to explore. Uh, there is an activity that comes with the table called forensic investigation. It actually uses a bullet to the head case, as well as the two gunshot tracks that I talked about earlier. And the students get to locate the bullet. Uh, if they're older students, some of them even get to uh, hypothesize um, what weapon could have been used or what type of weapon could have been used to inflict this wound and so on. Uh, so these are the preset activities, and I think they work really, really well um, with, with uh, K through 12 students um, who come in to explore STEM.